Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 2nd of June, or I'm Robert Barwick, and I'm joined today by CEC Leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, more signs Australia heading for economic crash, and time for an honest talk about Trump. Um, first, though, Craig, before we get into it, I want to really urge people to, if you haven't got a copy of the Australian Alert Service before, call in on our free number and order one. This week's issue has two very important articles in it. I'll refer to the second one later in the program. But the first one is uh, the details of what we talked about in last week's show about the Manchester terrorist attack. The episode was the Manchester attack who benefits. The, uh, the six page article we have in this week's alert is the Manchester terror attack, a new Peterloo massacre. And what we go through is all the details and all the evidence that we alluded to last week about how this is the state apparatus that where the British MI5, MI6 organisations actually orchestrate terrorist events. And it's a really big scandal. If the media in the UK wasn't so biased, Craig, and they were making an issue out of this, if they were chasing it down every rabbit hole, Theresa May would be out in her ear in the election yeah. because she was the Home Secretary who oversaw MI5 doing all this in regard to the Libyans involved in this Manchester attack. It's all documented in here. So call in on the toll-free number and get a free copy of the Australian Alert Service. Robbie, we can also, for people who would like this material quickly, we can send a PDF copy of it to them if they call in for yeah, it. So, so you call in our don't have to wait for Australia yep. Post and Snowmail. That's right. All right, so that's it. Let's get on with the show. More signs Australia heading for an economic crash. Um, let me start a bit different, Craig. I want to tell people about the Sword of Damocles. Uh, you can look it up yourself, see the full story. The Sword of Damocles is a Greek moral. And it's a story about a king who allowed one of his subjects named Damocles to sit on his own throne for a day just so he could experience what it was like to rule. But to make the experience real for Damocles, the king suspended a sword, a super sharp sword, over Damocles' head, hanging by a single thread. So that Damocles felt that threat all day. Like a hair. That, that. Like, like a hair, yeah, yeah, not a thread, a hair, an actual hair. So that is the sword of Damocles. The reason I'm saying that is because the sword of Damocles hanging over the Australian economy is the property bubble. And when it falls, it will smash the Australian financial system, right? And so we have some more indicators now how close that is coming to being. So first, last week, the Australian newspaper um, had an interesting report about real unemployment in Australia. And their headline was that real unemployment in Australia is not 5.7% that the official statistics show. It is more than 20%. And this figure, is in, it includes what we call underemployment. So it, it's the official figure, it includes the people not counted because they've given up looking for work and it includes underemployment. And that underemployment category, Craig, is a big one. It sure right? is. Yeah. Now, um, the reason it's so big is because from the Hawke Keating era on, we've had this liberalised economy and full-time jobs have been increasingly replaced by part-time jobs. But what ends up happening, so you'll have, you'll have all these apologists come out and say, it's, oh, it's, such, so, so, it's so much more flexible for people, isn't that great? But of course, the flexibility of employment doesn't count too well when you're trying to pay your bills, right? People really want more work. That's, that's a hallmark of this part-time work in Australia. People really want more work. Um, now, there are people who come back and say, oh, no, that, there's, that, there's nothing wrong with the way we count um, unemployment, but, of course, there actually is. So you've, you've looked into yeah, a little bit about because, these excuses. Yeah, this has been a constant problem for... Constant lying, I would say, Robbie, because, look... The International Labour Organisation is the international organisation that coordinates the statistics and yeah. other things relating to unemployment. And we've adopted those statistics, which says, and cop this, that if you work for just one hour a week or you're looking, actively seeking work um, and currently available for work, right, then you're employed. So one hour a week. One hour a week, right. And this is the international consistent standard for including people as being employed. Now, Craig, unless you're a lawyer, a high-end lawyer, charging $500 an hour for that one hour a week, how can you possibly live Well, you can't. And the, and the point is, um, 
you, we argue the direct fact that if you, if you work for one hour a week, you can't sustain yourself, right? But they argue, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the International Labor Organization argues that from an economic perspective, and I'll quote them, any time in paid work, no matter how small, con contributes to economic production and therefore is included in the national accounts. Fundamentally, labour force statistics are economic indicators and need to be coherent with other economic measures. It's got nothing to do with how you pay your bills or the reality of, yep. of uh, people's personal lives. But also, Robbie, they say, and I quote, socially, it is recognised that employment is associated with improved psychological and social well-being. Which it, it is. It is therefore important to distinguish between those who have any work, even a, a small number of hours, and those who do not. So if you're only working one hour a week, if you're working one hour a week, Robbie, you're fine, right? You're, so you're psychologically you're, fine. You're psychologically fine, you feel, you're contributing you feel enough and so forth. You can't pay your bills, right? Yeah, yeah. You see all these but prices going up. you feel less of a leech, up. so you're fine. But this is the fallacy, right? Yeah. Instead of looking at the, the, the reality from the reality of people have to have a certain income, a yeah. decent income to survive, high paying work, um, they apply a statistical measure, an arbitrary statistical measure, in order to get statistics. Now, we know that statistics, at best, are only a shadow of reality, and they're only a shadow shaped by the underlying assumptions. So when you start to quote unemployment figures of 5.7%, you're taking a politically agreed to norm, which doesn't necessarily re re reflect reality, and you're saying, this is how we're going to measure everything. Well, and, that, and the, I'll take up on one of those aspects of these, the fact that these, in, this, the International Labor Organization makes these statistics uniform around the world. And that's what the statistician, statisticians in Australia state say. We're just following the international standard. Well, that's true. No economy is measured accurately. And the proof of that is that Donald Trump got elected by people who are desperately um, uh, worried about their personal economic circumstances. There's a huge upswell of support for Jeremy Corbyn in the United Kingdom, who's a much more genuine figure than Donald Trump, because he genuinely cares about their economic circumstances and he knows that they're not reflected in the official statistics. And you see, you've got governments that are saying, but look, statistically we're fine, right? Which is like the, the joke about the economist who puts one foot in a bucket of ice and one foot in the fire and says, on average, I feel great. Right? And this is, this is the insanity of it all. They're not reflecting what's reality. And if, and if they were, you wouldn't have this global voter revolt we're feeling, which is economically driven. Right? Mm -hmm. So ignore those excuses. This is a real problem in Australia, this kind of unemployment. And the people that are losing their jobs are losing productive jobs, industrial jobs, full-time jobs. And so just before we break, it's having a knock-on effect. And the latest of those is... Um, yesterday, the chief economist of the National Australia Bank, Alan Oster, reported that Australia's retail sector is already in recession. And it's not a simple, it's not a complicated equation, Craig. Less work equals less money to spend, right? And the retail sector, of course, is a big sector. So all these things are, are running into problems. And I'll put up a graph on the, um, that I meant to use a second ago on the screen, which shows the number of hours worked in Australia, right, aggregately by everybody, the, amount of, the number of hours worked has been steadily declining since 2008. And if the total number of hours working is falling, people are not getting paid what they need to be paid for to keep the rest of the economy going. Well, actually, Robert, particularly just to underscore that, the fact is that real wages, the value of real, yep. wa real wages has not increased yep. in the last three years. All right, so let's take a break and we'll continue this afterwards. Welcome back to the CEC report where we're discussing more signs Australia heading for an economic crash. So Craig, back to the sort of Damocles again. The thread, the sort of Damocles is the property bubble hanging over Australia, which when that bursts, it will wipe out the financial system. We've been saying this for a long time. The thread holding it up, the, the, the single hair, is affordability. Mm. And that's why it relates to what we are talking about before the break, because when our retail sector is in recession, when Re total hours work is going down when wages are not um, rising for people, etc. But the real estate, Robbie, is the key here because if you've yep. got to rent a home, a basic home for five hundred dollars a week, in which is basically just a basic, you know, uh, you know, a standard home, 
because that's what the market is paying. Well, how do you do that if you're not working full time? In fact, how do you do it if you're not, you don't have two jobs like yep. a working family? You can't do it. And then you, you look at the question of housing affordability to buy mortgages and so forth. You just see how difficult it is for ordinary people to actually pay their way, this question of affordability. Now, you know, historically, uh, the cost of owning a home should only ever be, the price of the home should only be one th you know, three times the average medium wage. Now, we know in Australia that in Sydney and Melbourne, that's factors in multiples of 10, 11 and 12. Well, the headline today, Craig, is, I'll we'll put this graphic on the screen, I'm sorry about the colours, but um, that's what it was provided for on the Real Estate Institute of Victoria website. It'd be better if this was red, that the number of suburbs in Melbourne where the median price is over a million has gone from 30 back in 2012, five years ago it was 30, this year it's 120. And this graphic shows how these, this is spreading. And what the, the headline should actually be, unaffordability cancer spreading across Melbourne. That's what it is. This is not a good graphic. Sorry if you own one of those house, houses, but you're going to, very soon, what you think it's worth, ain't, it ain't going to be worth. You see, be Rob, flat out holding onto it. Yeah, this is a terrible problem. Yeah, and it's a direct result of political decisions not being made. Look, we could have a high-speed magnetic levitation train from here to places like Aubrey Wodonga into Shepparton and so forth, and that would then open up, like an artery, open up the regional areas for more development yep. and take the pressure off the city. So this, is, this has been a deliberate policy for a long time in order to prop up the banks and the implicit reliance on property values as assets. And as we showed last week though, Craig, that's, that's just part of it. The other part of it is, it's not even the demand from ordinary people, it's, it, it's investors that the banks are lending to like crazy. So here's the thing, when that, you know, all the signs are showing that this, we are now so unaffordable it's not funny and this could crash soon. More and more experts have started to agree with this, but something new happened this week um, that was different from previous because up until now, a lot of experts have said, yes, there's a property bubble, um, some city group banker overseas has just referred to Australia and says Australia has a spectacular property bubble, right? Um, but this week, a, an asset fund manager in Australia named Altair Asset Management put his money where his mouth is and he closed down his entire investment fund, returned the money to his investors and he said, because we're heading for a property crash. So this is a guy who's putting his money where his mouth is, right? And it's really shocked people. I'll give you his, his name's Philip Parker. I'll, I'll give you his quotes. He explained it was because all signs are pointing to a property crash. He wrote, he could not in good conscience keep charging fees, quote, when there are so many early warning lead indicators of clear and present danger. Hmm. To me, there are specific identifiers that are extremely recognisable that remind me of the late 80s and early 90s housing calamity, he said. And then in another publication to a Fairfax reporter, this guy Parker elaborated, quote, I am absolutely certain we are in a bubble in this property market. Mortgage fraud is endemic, it's systemic. It's just terrible what's going on. When you've got 30 year olds who've never seen a property downturn before, borrowing up to 80% to buy three or four apartments, it's a bubble. Australia hasn't had its GFC event. We've been living in this quote, fool's paradise. That's what he said. And I have to, there's one response, the New Daily, which is an internet publication, um, went to a, a, um, a property market analyst for a response to what this Philip Park had said. So the, they quoted Martin North, and he was very unhappy with Parker's decision and what he was saying, because he said, the only upside, this is what this guy admitted, the only upside for the Australian economy at the moment is, quote, sentiment and enthusiasm and that a shock move like Altair's could be all it takes to tip the scales. Quote, sentiment is crucial, which is why everyone wants to be buoyant and talk positive. There's no doubt that with the international connectivity of the international markets, sentiment can be amplified and become self-fulfilling. If you call it right at the right point, you can make a lot of money, but what's the collateral damage? <laughs> That's what he's saying. You know, you, you, you by doing this, you might have upset it for the rest of us. So Craig, if the Australian economy is hanging on by sentiment and enthusiasm, what hope have we got? Well, Rob, I think you've answered your own question. I mean, the point is that there's going to be a crash. It has to be a crash. It has to fall down because there's, unless you've got something substantial underneath your economy in order to provide high-paying real wages to people, it's got, all, all, can, all that can happen is it falls down. 
And I'll come back to what I said before. Look at the, the, the way that cities are being built or not being built yep. in this country. We are a large country. We need to have very high-speed trains, magnetic levitation technologies to open this country up. And if we did that, it's not about sentiment. It's about people see opportunities and they'll <coughs> go and do it. Jobs will come. And the cost... You know, they'll just multiply on the back of that. I always use the example, if you didn't have the Sydney Harbour Bridge and all the Sydney Harbour Tunnel, how would Sydney develop? It yep. didn't. So the, the great coat hanger that was built by JJC Bradfield was derided and ridiculed by all the political politicals at the time, except Jack, Jack Lang, who really supported it. That has become a backbone of infrastructure for the development of the whole area. Now, it only costs, I think it's about $80 million to build. What's the net economic value today yep. in terms of what that actually provides for? And that's the role of infrastructure. Yes, it costs money. It won't matter if it's one or two or five billion dollars to build a high-speed rail just up through into, you know, all the way through to Dubbo, right? The economic spin-off for that, for people's uh, economic uh, inputs, for the economic activity, will be huge. And it's not just measured in five years or ten years, it's measured over 50 to 100 years. So this is how economics is not approached mm. in this country. Is that if you have, unless you provide real jobs, real backbone infrastructure, water, electricity, transport, and not just talk about it, this is the sort of economy we have to put up with and, and these are the sorts of crashes that are coming. And basically what you say, <clears throat> what you're referring to, Craig, is this crash doesn't actually have to be feared. It, you can deal with it straight away like that, um, but we have to change the way we're doing things. And I'll just say before we go to a break, um, we're going to put a link for, for YouTubers go, to remind them, go to our Glass-Steagall petition, right, because that's a necessary thing to protect us from this and we've explained it a lot in previous episodes, so, so, so go look at that. Um, get on it. If, you, if you're not on, watching us on YouTube, go down our, on our website. Go to change.org and sign the CEC's Glass-Steagall petition because this is happening really fast. Mm. Something big could break any moment, right? So we have to be prepared for that in Australia. So let's take a break and we'll, when we come back, we'll talk honestly about Donald Trump. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Finally, time for an honest talk about Trump. So, Craig, last week Donald Trump visited Saudi Arabia, where he did the sword dance with the king and denounced Iran for sponsoring terrorism. Now, a lot of people who followed Trump's campaign and who followed the CEC Report and what we have said over time about Trump have said, what? on earth is going on because to put it mildly his actions don't fit his previous statements right and I'll, I'll give you some of them and some of these statements show they're not just um, opinions off the top of his head he had considered opinions on this in 2011 Donald Trump said of Saudi Arabia quote it's the world's biggest funder of terrorism Saudi Arabia funnels our petrodollars to fund the terrorists that seek to destroy our people while the Saudis rely on us to protect them. And then in the campaign last year, he rightly said that the Saudis were behind 9-11. So he was, and he was right on that, right? So the Saudi visit, Craig, is just one of the issues that Trump has seemingly gone back on. Bombing Syria was another one. It was a big one, right? But dancing with the Saudis, you have to say, is, a, is about as blatant as it gets. So the big question is, what is going on? Now, I was asked that question this week, and, and the questioner said to me, look, if Trump is like this, how do we know Jeremy Corbyn in the United Kingdom would be any better? Right? You guys were happy Trump got elected. You know, you're really happy about Jeremy Corbyn if he gets elected. It's a good question, but it has a clear answer. Jeremy Corbyn has a 30-year track record of sticking to his principles. Mm -hmm. right? Donald Trump didn't have a track record. And the way I think of it is Jeremy Corbyn Craig is an, is an intentional threat to the establishment. That's what he stood for all his life. Donald Trump, I see, is more an accidental threat to the establishment. He's like a loose cannon, but a loose cannon sometimes shoots in the right direction, <laughs> right? But um, even as a loose cannon, I will still say he has more potential than Hillary or his predecessors, George Bush and Barack Obama, to sometimes do the right thing. And this is quite important. Uh, Robbie, can I say something here? Because I mean, I've been doing some meetings around the country and. I was, I was stunned by Franklin Delano Roosevelt or FDR because Franklin Roosevelt was a was a incredibly you know um, 
important figure in the US in yeah. turning around the Great Depression. And what he did is he built up the New Deal. But see, that New Deal only went through to 1937. And then he himself, Franklin Roosevelt, couldn't get up from underneath the politics of Washington and Congress. The swamp. The swamp for two years. So from 1937, all the people that were employed in the public works programs of his were actually laid off yeah. till 1939 until he began the war mobilisation. So when you look at actual politics and avoid the personality politics and you see the forces that you have to deal with, then you get a different sense of how politics works as opposed to just having you know, pristine crystal exactly, glasses exactly. on looking at you know, people's... So you, you've, made, you've, you've drawn a comparison there to, to Roosevelt. I'm going to draw a different comparison, but let's just situate it first. The big issue for Trump is Russia, right? Um, because of his desire, this is one of the things we support him for, because of his desire for better relations with Russia, he has come under the most extraordinary deep state attack of any president since... John F. Kennedy. And this is an important comparison, Craig, because it's Kennedy's 100th birthday on the 29th of May, right? And so what we have done is we're running, we're serialising an article in the Australian Alert Service. It's just been written by an American historian called Anton Chaik and a friend of ours. The headline is, The coup then and now, the enemies of humanity try to give Trump the JFK treatment. And this is not a comparison of their personalities or their politics. It's a comparison of what they're up against in trying, because with Kennedy, the issue was, was Russia as well. Kennedy came to power just as the Cold War was really heating up. And he desperately wanted to take the heat out of it. But he came up against this apparatus in the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies around him that were determined that wasn't going to happen. They wanted this thing to get hotter and hotter and hotter. And, and here was Kennedy, a young guy, and he was having to stand up to these generals that you know, used to be his commanders and that, right? But that was the defining thing. And, and Anton Chaikin has gone through that in detail in this um, publication. Uh, there are, there are vipers that, that surrounded Kennedy, right? And so outsiders, if we were living in 1960 and 1961 with hope for JFK, we would look at some of the decisions he's made and go, oh, how could he have done that? Like, look up the Bay of Pigs invasion, for instance, right? That is terrible. How could he have possibly done that? But, um, and Tony gives the background to that type of thing. So what I want to encourage viewers to do, Craig, is call in and actually get a free copy of the alert service and read that publication, right? It's very important to have that kind of insight. Because again, don't get me wrong, we're not saying that, you know, I mean, Donald Trump is a flawed guy. Right? He's not a perfect person at all, but there was a few things that distinguished him from Hillary, and this question of Russia was the big one. The people that are leading the attack on him, and I'll give you the example of John McCain, who was in Australia this week. John McCain is part of a, Senator John McCain, a chorus of Americans who are part of this deep state apparatus. Every time Trump makes a move that might result in better relations with Russia, they launch a brutal attack on him. Every time he does something dangerously stupid, like bombing Syria, they praise him to the hilt. Right? And this is the kind of situation that he's in at the moment. And if you want an insight, you've got to look back at this historic precedent. So call in and get a copy of the Australian Alert Service to actually do that. Because we have a role in this. That's the key thing, Robbie. We have to create the field. We have to create the yep. environment with which you know, people act and our elected leaders and will good policies can succeed. In, our, in crea us creating that environment. And if people sit back and say, oh, well, look at these people and don't no, do they're anything, all the same. They're right. then yeah. you're part of the problem. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, so thanks for tuning into the CEC report. Like I said, call in for a copy of this and tune in next week for more of the CEC report.